Good afternoon. Thank you, FIGO Landes Group in Canada, for having me invited once again. So I'm able here in a room in this uh, library to have a presentation once again. My name is Christian Frehner. I'm 67 years old, married, father, grandfather, and I'm a member of the core group since uh, 1987 of FIGO in Switzerland. And I have to start right now with a, a remark, a preliminary remark. Uh, speaking in English is not one of my talents, and therefore I have to follow my script. And this will result in kind of a monologue, of course, but uh, you will see a lot of pictures and small videos. And if I could also have some false pronunciation, that's also possible. If someone should not understand what I'm saying, just say stop and interfere and ask uh, about the clarification. Uh, this is the title of my presentation of today here. And to start with, a few introductory explanations are essential for the understanding of the ensuing presentation, which has been announced to you by the title, as you can read here behind me. And I've chosen this topic for two main reasons, actually. I knew that my presentation would be filmed and made available through the internet and instead of you having to listen to a monologue and continuously look at, looking at me and probably contemplating the size of my beard, I can repeatedly divert your attention away from me and towards the many images and videos you will see here on the screen. And the other reason, that's not, not quite a too much serious reason, the other reason is to relieve you and me also from the obligation to go into details if you are requested to explain why the Billy Meyer case is true or not true. In the future, you may simply refer any interested or questioning person to view my presentation that's recorded here and to draw, let them, these persons draw their own conclusions. This will give you more free time for your personal evolution. From this, you may deduce that the application of a portion of egoism can be useful and help to preserve one's serenity. It's up to you now to keep our receptivity on a high level. And however, as you already know from my introduction, in case you will sleep during a part of my presentation, don't worry or scold yourself because you will be able to fill in any gap by later watching the video. Of course, only if you make no mistake, Peter. <laughs> but now, seriously, with regard of the information I will present to you today, I'm aware that there already exist valuable efforts by various persons to this end, and I will refer to some of those visual and literal endeavors. However, what I'm intending to achieve is some kind of a overall survey or summing up. Critical viewers may justifiably, or perhaps also among you, may justifi justifiably ask about why I should be an appropriate and qualified person to defend and judge the authenticity of the Billy Meyer case. Because the fact that I'm a FIGO member for over 35 years obviously determines the final verdict of my presentation right from its beginning. Therefore, I suggest that those who are skeptic about my role just imagine to be the judge and having to listen to my pleading in which I am delivering ample evidence to support the case. Of course, I see good reasons why I'm qualified to stand he here, or rather sit here, 
in front. Where I'm here, that's the, the problem of reading. Of course, I see good reasons why I'm qualified to stand here in support of this case. I will list three of them, of these good reasons. First, I'm a non-believer. I don't believe in any religion, ideology, ideology uh, philosophy, or hypotheses, or conspiracy theories, etc., and I strive to look at things and occurrences with a neutral stance. And I suggest that all the smartphones are put on airplane modus, I think it's called. Second, even if I don't have a university degree, at least I've learned three different professions and earned the corresponding diplomas. I just mentioned this because I've noticed a substantial amount of intellectual snobbery among many academics who are using their title to presumptuously look down on the ordinary people while unintentionally make a, make a fool of themselves because they avoid to neutrally look at reality outside of their self-restricted professional scope. Such persons don't want to accept the fact that the application of logic and the use of rationality and intellect do not require a university degree. And third, as a core group, a FICO core group member since, I said, 1987, I have to spend several days each month at the Semiasi Silver Star Center, and therefore, I had and continue to have the opportunity to closely observe and monitor Billy Meyer's words, deeds and actions over a long time. Therefore, I can assure you that I would have left FIGU already a long time ago if I would have witnessed manipulation attempts or cheating or suppression, etc. from Billy's side. Now, after this uh, or that clarification, let's continue to deal with other important preconditions. Since the title of my presentation uses the words here true and not true or untrue, it is necessary to start with the definition of the terms truth and untruth. A look into Wikipedia provides this here. As you can read, truth is most often used to mean being in accord with fact or reality or fidelity to an original or standard. In his book, Decalogue, Do Decalogue, Billy Meyer defines truth as follows. In German, it's like this here. Die effektive Übereinstimmung des Wissens mit der Logik die da ist die Schöpfungskraft und das Absolutum aller Folgerichtigkeit. And which translate here reads, the effective correlation or concordance of the knowledge with the logic, that which is creation power and the absolutum of all logicalness. This means that truth can only be found where knowledge and also logic exist in combination. And if you look at the definition of knowledge in that book, it reads like this. Wissen is the Ergebnis absolut logischer Erkenntnis in Erkennung der Wahrheit. Knowledge is the result of absolute logical cognitions in recognition of the truth. The conclusion to be drawn from these two definitions is that truth can only be found in reality because only reality, that which re really exists, like this table here, can bring forth the truth. This is no cow here, it's a table. <laughs> that's, that's the truth. Based on this, 
it also clear that terms like belief, opinion, supposition, hypothesis, and theory, etc., have no correlation whatsoever with the truth. Perhaps it is helpful to give two examples for a clarification. The first one, based on their study of the Torah and the Bible, Orthodox Jews and fundamentalist Christians are claiming and believing that our universe was created about 6,000 years ago by God in heaven. This God was, according to the holy texts, quite actively interfering into the daily life of the Hebrews and the non-Hebrews of that time with a mixture of out outrage, revenge, murder, promises, huffiness, mercilessness and privileging, etc. And he ceased to speak to human beings about 2,000 years ago. It is exactly this God who is believed to be the one who created everything that exists, the whole universe, everything. And there is the question, is this true or not true? And how does this belief correspond with logical and sensible questions like what is God show, show, what will God show us with dinosaur fossils and petrified trees? And why did he trouble himself to create a trillion of galaxies billions of light years away in the vastness of space when our eyes are not capable to look so far into space? And why did he not present himself in China, for example? Because it can be assumed that even in those days more people lived in China than in Palestine. Now, what is belief? What is reality? And the second example, I use or want to refer to scientists and non-scientists who are claiming that mankind will never know whether human beings exist on other worlds because human beings will never be capable to bridge the huge distances measured in light years between our solar system and other worlds in a physical life. True or not true? Judge for yourself at the end of my presentation. And now, and lastly, there's another important prerequisite I have to explain prior to the main body of my presentation. My intention is to provide information, facts, and log logical conclusions. According to the saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. I'm certainly not attempting to convince anybody or anyone through my lecture or my symbolic pleading. Any such attempt would be futile from its beginning because nobody can convince another person regarding anything. And should there occur any form of being convinced, then this has been processed individually by a person, him or herself. It means that the person is suppressing or exchanging his or her own opinion, meaning, and supposition, etc., with an external opinion, meaning, and supposition, which is foreign to one's own thoughts, etc. And because the convinced person has surrendered to the external opinion, it is just a matter of belief. And the belief is based on its definition never in accord <coughs> with reality and therefore with the truth. I think it's appropriate at this moment to use a quote from Billy Meyer's uh, new book, which will be published, I think, uh, before the end of this year. And here we have the text that you can follow my pronunciation. Contrary to conviction or persuasion stands certainty, which originates alone from a given fact and therefore from realness, reality, and its truth, which throughout may be proven and have nothing to do with a conviction, but is integrated into an effective knowledge 
as well as into that which is given by and which is fact or through, reality and its truth. Certainty is a firm, steadfast knowledge that can be proven through the verification of an issue or through experience and the living of it and therefore through reality and its truth. And this is, uh, has been now my uh, introduction. And before I come to the main body of my presentation, are there any questions so far? Or is all clear what I wanted to say? Looks like um, uh, here. Where are are here? Now imagine that you have entered the court, and I, as Billy Myers' defending lawyer, would have to counter the accusation by Billy Myers' antagonists of him being a sly liar and fraudulent guru who enticed gullible persons to become addicted to a cult. I would start my overall survey with a short list of statements about what makes the Billy Meyer case unique compared to any other so-called UFO case. Eduard Albert Meyer not Meyer, Meyer, was born in 1937 in a town called Bülach, north of Zürich in Switzerland. Here is a, he's about seven years old, this photo. At the age of five, he was telepathically contacted by an extraterrestrial man named Svart here. This was a very old ma man about 1,000 years old at that time. Being afraid of becoming insane when hearing the voice in his head, the boy Edward sought counsel from the local pastor Zimmermann. Um, yeah. Who had already been initiated by his father and could relieve the boy's angst. There's a younger age and an older age. The contact with Svart lasted for 11 years and throughout Edward's entire school years. And then for the next 11 years, Edward had a female teacher named Asket, originating from the Dahl universe. After having left school, Edward led a very adventurous and often dangerous life. He worked in many different jobs and professions, and he was more or less constantly on his way by train, bus, hitchhiking, camel, or feet, or donkey, between Switzerland, Morocco, Turkey, Iraq, Israel, Jordan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. During his traveling, he met and was able to speak with many famous persons, and here is a, a small excerpt or list of these. Those who live longer, are uh, older age here, will know who these peoples were. Because of his clothing, Billy's clothing, here we have a, a picture of him in India. He still had two arms at that time. A broad brimmed hat, pistol, and a knife, a long knife on his belt. He got his nickname Billy in Tehran, in Persia, from an US, U.S. American woman named Judy Reed, when she compared him with the famous Billy the Kid of Western fame. From that time on, the nickname Billy stuck on him. After having finished several months of study at the monk Tarmavaras, here's a picture of him, a shock commission in Merauli near New Delhi, Edward, or Billy, lost his left arm in a bus accident in Turkey one year later. By the way, Dharma Vara moved, later moved to the United States and, and died about, uh, at the age of about 110 years. He had there, he had a, a, a center, meditation center or something like this. Uh, lost, uh, Billy lost his left arm in a bus accident in Turkey one year later. 
after this photo that you just have seen. And a couple of months later of that accident uh, here, he married a Greek girl named Calliope. Calliope there. And their first child, a daughter, was born in Quetta in West Pakistan. Of course, more than nine months after marriage. At that time, in 1967, and based on his study of Islam, Edward Meyer was appointed the Islamic honorary title of Sheikh Mohammed Abdullah. That's the head of this paper, this document, and the document looks like this. This has been in, in the Ahmani, Ahmani uh, Moshe, 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 Moshe. In, in Turkey. The birth of his daughter and her having health-related problems led to a, a return to Switzerland and to settle down because he had to earn a regular income for the support of his growing family. In January 1975, Billy was summoned by a female voice in his head to a remote place near Hinville. There he met the Pleiadian woman Semyase, from a planet named Era in the constellation of the Pleiadian, which is about 500 light years distance away from Earth and beyond the Pleiades that we see on our night sky. In another dimension that is shifted from our a fraction of a second. After having had the occasion to shoot hundreds of photos, and several 8 mm films of beam ships, as the flying devices or UFOs were called by the extraterrestrial visitors. Billy informed the media about his collection of photos, santé, and films, and the connected contacts with extraterrestrials from the Pleiades, as their origin was said to be during the first years. A del deliberate decision to lay a false trail in order to later expose all the copycats who surfaced from the esoteric swamp claiming to be in contact with Pleiadians, unconscious of the fact that the Pleiades we see on our night sky bear no life whatsoever because they are much too young for such. Prior to this, Billy had founded in 1975 FIGU, Free Community Universal, or Free Community of Interest in Spiritual Sciences and UFOlogical Studies. That's when the Billy Meyer case was officially launched, and with it as planned, the so-called UFO controversy. Consequently, articles about the Swiss farmer started to appear Worldwide, I have here a, a few examples here. In Quick, this was one of the first articles in, in a German magazine. Here, another one. Or here, that's a, a tabloid in Switzerland that still exists today. Here you see down here, Erich, Erich van Däniken, you see here. Mm. Yeah. Okay, below. So, and this is, and there are also, in America also, here you see um, the Arizona Republic, uh, an excerpt from December 16, 1979. And all these uh, articles that Figo got hold of were later um, included in a, in a large book like this size here. Uh, a lot of many articles worldwide uh, are available to read through in this large book here. English, Italian, French, all kinds of languages. Of course, there were more articles than these that are in here, but these are the only articles that we got in possession of. Like 
good as planned, evoking a massive UFO controversy was really successful and had two main effects. On the one hand, the publicity stirred interest for the events and message behind the UFOlogical frontage of the Billy Meyer case and let many people finally find a limitless source of knowledge and wisdom. On the other hand, the reactions, especially from and in the UFOlogical circles, provided a pathetic display of incompetence, ignorance, delusion, defamation, profit craving, disinformation, prejudices, outright stupidity and a lack of character, beside, of course, honest interest. Searching for information about the Millie Meyer case in the index of UFO, so-called UFO lexica or books of ex experts will demonstrate my explanation made just a couple of seconds ago. Instead of seriously researching the Billy Meyer case, the huge majority of the self-appointed UFO experts and believers turned out to be incapable to recognize and are still ignoring to see the shining precious pearl among the foul swamp of illusion, delusion and profit craving. Here you see a part of our library at the Semyasi Silver Star Center and books about UFO, the UFO topic here, uh, under, here down here. These are Japanese uh, journals here about UFOs and uh, here uh, these are is UFOlogical literature and here you see all kinds of uh, books here. Contactees, frauds, all kinds of crazy stories and so-called scientific examinations. And I'm here. Yeah. Fortunately, the Billy Meyer case was also aroused interest among open-minded persons, which led to an in-depth investigation by a professional research team from the United States. Between 1978 and 1982, several research expeditions to the Semyasi Silver Star Center were organized by the world-famous UFO expert, the late Wendell C. Stevens. Here you see him, he died nine years ago, he, um, here. And Liam Britt Elders and Thomas Welch of the Arizona-based Intercept team, along with Yunichi Yaoi here from the Nippon Television, <coughs> Japanese from Japan. What Billy Meyer could offer to the investigation teams was an astonishing body of evidence, absolutely outstanding and incomparable to any other UFO case ever and up until today. The variety, numbers and quality of his body of evidence makes the Billy Meyer case unique and raises it into an entirely different cat category compared with the whole rest of sightings of unidentified objects. And exactly this fact has been and continues to be a unsurmountable barrier for the thinking capacities of many of those self-designated UFO experts, fake contactees, channelers, or pseudo, pseudo, pseudo scientists, pseudo, 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 pseudo scientists, etc who claim or believe that the evidence cannot be true because of its high quality, among other reasons. And now I will start with the presentation of this huge body of evidence partitioned into seven chapters. In 1964, a reporter of the Statesman from Delhi in India interviewed a Swiss man he called Mr. Edward Albert. The newspaper had been informed by local persons 
because the Swiss had been observed in connection with flying saucers. And an extraterrestrial woman since he had arrived at the Ashoka mission in Merauli. During his interview, the reporter had the occasion to, of browsing through a photo album containing about 80 photos of flying discs, flying saucers of various types and forms. And these black and white photos of the Swiss man had ta taken, had he, he had taken with an old, for those who don't know how these were, an old folding cup camera he kept in his backpack. My father also had one of these in my youth. The following day, Mr. Edward Albert was heading back to Switzerland. And here you see a few examples of the photos he had taken at the time and up to the mid-60s. As a side note, I want to tell you an, an amusing anecdote Billy told me. During his traveling back to Switzerland, an officer in Jordan wanted to look through the photo album and was asking all kinds of peculiar questions. After Billy had been evasive, evasive in his answers, the photo album was confiscated by the Jordanian Secret Service and Billy was accused as being a spy from Mars. After several hours of interrogation, Billy was released when he requested a telephone call with the Swiss embassy. Luckily, these photos here I've just displayed had not been inserted, had yet, not yet been inserted into the photo album and were stored at the fr friend's house and therefore they survived. Regarding these events, I don't want to go into more details because the existence of that article from 1964 is a jackpot argument in favor of the Billy Meyer case. I will just refer to an excellent article uh, written last year in January by Joe Tisk. You will find it here on Michael Horn's blog. Joe Tisk had analyzed the statesman article by applying the three, three aspects, means, motive, opportunity. Applied this on the, on the article, as these aspects are also used in criminal law to determine whether or not someone could be guilty of a crime, or in Billy's case, a hoax. Joe Tisk. That's the name how it's written. Absolutely logical reasoning provides a firm and strong foundation for everything else that I will present to you. As I told you before, Billy Meyer started to take his hundreds of clear photos in January 1975. I will soon show you two astonishing examples. However, prior to that, I want to lead your attention to the following seven facts which should be considered when viewing Billy's photos. First, Billy Meyer has just one arm. He, he did this hundreds of photos with one hand, his right hand. Second, Billy Meyer used this simple Olympus camera which he had bought from his brother. The distance ring here is stuck in the infinity position. Therefore, he could not adjust the focus of the camera to objects nearby. In other words, objects right in front of the camera must appear somewhat blurred. Fourth, usually Billy Meyer used positive film material and when full, he had to send the film roll to a Kodak laboratory and in return he received slides. And here usually there was the date when the, the processing occurred. For his 8mm footage, Billy Meyer used sealed 
film cassettes. These also had to be sent to laboratory and were delivered back in the form of film reels like these here. Sixth, when Billy was summoned by his extraterrestrial friends to go to a photo session, he usually was using his moped, I think it's called, moped and a small bike, bike uh, trailer here, with which he transported his photo and 8mm camera and the tripod. And with that vehicle, he certainly was not able to transport a several meter long pole with a fishing line or a helicopter to fake his photos. And seventh, there was never found any laborat 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 labor labor in German, laboratory material and devices, as for instance a dark room anywhere in the rooms of the Sim Simiasi Silverstar Center. Something other that is really important, the capability to use digital manipulation started around the year 1985, as you may see here. In this magazine of July 1985. This title photo here was assembled by using a $1 million plus machine here at um, Pacific Lithographic in San Francisco, three years after Billy Meyer had stopped taking any further photos from the beam ships, and especially also of, of the so-called wedding cake UFO. And here you see some other pictures from this article here. This is the model they were using. They were, uh, this was really the starting of dig digitalizing uh, photos in 1985. There's an article about this. Huh? And it's also important to know is that Photoshop, Photoshop, uh, the software where you can uh, work with photos and falsify and improving everything was first published in 1988 that's six years later as uh, when Billy had stopped to photograph the beam ships Billy could not have any of these, these uh, software uh, programs or even the hardware of <laughs> over one million dollar uh, to you to fake his photos I won't, don't want to go more into details here because you will find a summarizing information about these technical aspects in a very interesting video by Harald Schossmann from the FIGU study group in Austria. Just search for this title here. It's in English also available and it's very uh, recommended to view. It's uh, very well made. Since the publication of the book Photo Inventarium, Figo has stopped to sell, sell the small photographs we used to sell from these slides we made photographs and sold them for interested persons. We have stopped to do this and uh, because we have, uh, you see this book for those who don't know the book, the Photo Inventarium, we have more or less uh, most of the available photos about all kinds of uh, interesting facts uh, about the Billy Meyer case. We have uh, published or are publishing it in this book, which is available since a couple of years. So, good. And now for all those who, of you who had not a chance to browse through the, these pages here of this book or who are not yet familiar with the hundreds of beam ships photos Billy Meyer had taken between 1975 and 1982, I will display two series here on the screen. As an example for the extra 
extraordinary quality of the photographic evidence. I will start here with a photo series taken as Hasenbühl, it's called. And uh, the Hasenbühl it means this location up here on the hill. And you have to imagine that here once uh, in 1970, 76 here, uh, there was also a tree here that you will see in the photos, and Billy was taking the photos from, from this side. And I have been up there with Billy about 15 or so years ago. I went up there, made some, some footage and compared his pictures with the surroundings. And when we were up there standing here below, just on the back side here, there is, are several houses. And we were also already, people were looking up and it's, it's not a very intelligent position up here exposed to fake UFO pictures with a pole with one hand and with, with the same hand making photographs. That's Hasenbühl. And you also have to take into account here that uh, the photos that you right now will see have been shot within 70 minutes, all after another, and at the same time he could also shoot some 8 millimeter footage. Okay. Uh, this uh, this uh, is something else here. Uh, wrong order. Good, here we have the I think that's the video. Uh, okay, I show first the video. You see here the twigs, strong breeze has blown here. We are looking into the, to the east. He, and here down, here down, uh, I was standing making this photo here. Huh? And these are the photos. This is the tree here, isn't here anymore. It wasn't there anymore when I went up with Billy. But here you see the blurred twigs right in front of the camera. Here you see the movie, the 8 millimeter camera. And Semiasi was flying here and there and post for him to just, he just had to, to trigger the, make the photo. Two trees, there were two trees, not just one. Okay. And regarding the, the footage that was taken at the same location, uh, I have to say, regarding this footage, uh, you have to take into account that the material I'm using here for this, uh, for this footage is a great-great-grandfather version of the original footage, because the original film material was handed over to an Austrian television team, as reported here in, in Wendell Stevens' UFO contact from the Pleiades report. And after continuous attempts to get the material back, Billy only got a copy of his original footage. And this copy, or probably a copy of a copy, was projected on screen in Billy's living room. There was the Japanese uh, director, uh, Yunichi, was there, and they commented what they have seen 
through the, on the projection. Then the videotaped film was transformed from the NTSC into PAL format and later digitized from a copied VHS cassette onto a DVD and then extracted by me to be presented in the form as you will see right now or that you have already seen. I just repeat this here, this quality. And what you hear is Yunichi Yaoi in the background of Billy. This is just an excerpt from a longer film. Just for a demonstration. It's always very cold there, too, in summertime. But you have seen. You, you could this see the ship is not no, like going winter. like this, but it's also moving like this. And now to uh, the second example of an even longer series, taken about three weeks earlier on the 8th of March 1975 in the region of Bachtelhörn, linear Hinwil. In some of the photos, you will see the tripod Billy was using to attach his 8 millimeter camera. And if you look at the clouds viewed from different perspectives, you will notice that the photos were really taken on the same day and during several hours between late morning and early evening. Here, Here he used two rolls, two rolls of film. tricks here right in front of the camera the tripod is here you see this if his camera would have had full function he could have uh, made photos from very near, near the camera he would have to adjust the ring but he couldn't he could only make uh, photos to be sharp in the distance. And here also I have some footage to show you. It's all also an excerpt. And if you look close at the, there are three ships hovering at the one to the left, then you will notice that it is moving, making uh, footage here. It's, it's wobbling here, you see. Yeah. 
you have seen, could see more the, the, the movements. And in 1982, Billy was able to videotape some footage of the so-called Tortenschiff, we are calling it in, in German or within our group, due to its peculiar form here. This here, uh, or wedding cake UFO, as it is called in the English translation, or by English speaking persons. Here you see the, this uh, wedding cake ship or UFO right in front of the center, the main building here. And this video here, here you see. Already, you, perhaps you already know this video. You see Billy walking in front of the camera, shooting photos of the remote-controlled ship about 100 meters away. And this ship there in the background was at about 3.5 meters diameter, about from here to here. Enough. Yeah. The shape of this so called wedding cake UFO has provoked some astonishment and amusement and even led to accusations of being faked model made of the top of a barrel. I don't want to go into details here because any such kind of libel can be easily refuted by referring to the book, this book here, Researching a Real UFO by the authors Raoul Zahi and Christopher Locke. And it's a pleasure for me. Raoul Zahi is here, and actually his real name is Francisco Villate. <laughs> and now everything is clear. Huh? And uh, you are working on a second book yeah. at the moment. Yeah. And everyone who is uh, reading this book here, with a, a practical guide to the wedding cake UFO experimentation for young scientists, provide this book provides the irrefutable proof that a seven meter object has really been hovering in the court in front of Billy's home. Anyone with a grade six school knowledge is capable to duplicate the experiments and by applying and considering geometry and optical laws, etc., will come to the same conclusive results. By the way, in this book, you find download links to the analyzed photos in high resolution. I will close this first chapter with the note that actually the Billy Meyer case is no UFO case, but a IFO case, because 99% of the flying objects in his photos have been identified and have been proven to be of extraterrestrial origin. Chapter 2, further strong evidence concerning Billy's claims to be in contact with extraterrestrial has been provided by the sound recording and the metal specimen. The sound of the beam ship uh, of which I will play a sample to you was recorded by Billy's ex-wife, Calliope, because his own, as well as a third simultaneously occurring tape recording, were overmodulated because of the loudness of the sound and therefore could not be used. Probably most of you already heard this sound here. here. That's, that's enough here. And the metal sample <coughs> Billy had received from the Plearen to be analyzed in the United States was a silvery shining metallic alloy used, alloy used for the production process of the beam ships. 
The metal alloy was brought to the United States by Randall C. Stevens and was analyzed by the late Marcel Vogel, a research scientist working for nearly 30 years for IBM. He held at least 32 patents, patents, among them the magnetic coating for hard disk drive systems still in use. He was able to detect the fact that the alloy had been produced by a cold fusion process. And at this moment, I must categorize it as a mystery. I see. And uh, what is your result of the... Uh, uh, of this year? Of this material? Right now, yes. I could not explain the type of material that I have and its discreteness by any known combination of materials. I could not put it together myself as a scientist. Mm -hmm. To get a combination of thromium, silver, and uh, uh, silicon in discrete areas, yes, if I were to melt it mm -hmm. together, I would see the evidence of all of it. But their discreteness is what intrigues me. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I'm, yeah. what I'm saying? Because you see, if I were to take these combinations and put it into a furnace, melt it, mm -hmm. then pour it out and pull a little ingot, I would see the, all of these elements present there mm -hmm. in any one area. Mm -hmm. But I don't. I see this discrete bits of material. Now, it can only happen by some form of a cold fusion process where you have the elements present mm -hmm. and you fuse them together so they still maintain their identity but they interpenetrate into one another. Mm -hmm. So in another word, uh, do you think we, it, there is a possibility to find naturally and on this earth? We can, we can like find it? I'm going to look. I'm intrigued now. Mm. This is the type of thing I enjoy doing and dealing with, but it's also a challenge because I showed it to one of my friends who was a metallurgist, and he shook his head. He said, I don't see how it can be put together. Mm. And that's where we are right now. And I think it's important that those of us who are in the scientific world sit down and do some serious study on these things instead of putting it off as figments of people's imagination. Mm -hmm. I respect Mr. Stevens and the people I have met. I in respect their integrity. I'm doing this with no attempt, no desire for any form of remuneration. I want to know and I want to see. And that's the only reason that I'm digging into it. Mm -hmm. but if it's be a business or it's part of a corporation, I'm doing this independent of IBM. So, in another word, uh, could I uh, could I say this material is extraterrestrial? It doesn't look like anything that we've made here. At this moment, I would feel very much inclined to accept what was given to me as being true. After the analysis, the specimen vanished and could not be found anymore. Of course, the Pleiaren had fetched the specimen back to avoid that it would be used by the military or other interested parties. The experts who performed or commented the analysis came to the conclusion that both the sound and the metal sample could not be duplicated by any method known at that time and especially not by a single person lacking the necessary capabilities and funds. Everyone interested can read the detailed reports in the following sources in English, Gary Kinder's book Light Years, Randall Stevens' uh, investigation reports, or uh, on these four videos here, Contact, uh, or Beamship, the movie footage, the My Chronicles and um, Beam Ship the Metal. Now on to chapter three. For the sake of completeness, I will mention two other types of evidence. Firstly, the various uh, landing tracks of various types of beam ships. Here, burning, uh, heat emitting, these, all these... Uh, traces here, for, uh, they, they were imprinted on the ground for demonstration purposes that the beam ships don't land usually, they were deliberately landing so Billy could have something to, to make photos of. 
Additionally, and upon Billy's request, he was teleported down from a beep ship into the middle of a snow-covered meadow, which resulted in a line of footsteps that led out of the field, but none that went into the field. Here you see here he jumped down from the ship into the meadow and then went out to the, to the road over there. Um, just, it was wet snow here, you could have uh, detected two, two steps in one, one place. Huh? On another two occasions, Billy was allowed to use a borrowed antique laser gun with which he burned a hole through an apple tree on the Figo property. This has been recorded without sound. And now he goes to the position where he shot up here to this apple tree. Everybody who has been at the center already once, here is the, de the pond here. Huh? And here's the, the sitting patio, patio, sitting place. And this is the facility he had to use an old, an ancient laser, laser gun because the new ones are, can only be used by the owner. When nothing, no, no one else. And this was possible with a very old laser gun. And here you see the tree is going up. And the photo uh, filming was done by an extraterrestrial. She was, was using or zooming, zooming. It's showing here the from this side he shot to the tree and the, sh the, the beam came up out on the back side. Yeah, from here. You see the, the hole through the tree. Yeah. Okay. Later, 1998, when Jaime Maussan and um, Michael Hesemann were there to make fil filming and interviewing Billy, this uh, video was shot here, a short excerpt. The tree now exit, uh, has died in the meantime. At another location, he could burn a mark into a tree spark and could also cut two small branches through burning. I think I have this here. You see here the apple tree, the fresh marks uh, here, the burning marks here. And here you, he has shot two twigs I have another here. Here you see it burned. It's, it's difficult to burn two twigs at the same time like this. Eh? And here you see marks on, on tree barks, the bark of trees where he had uh, experimented with his laser gun. Chapter four. Due to occurrences that lead back into very ancient times and based on the profound instructions and teaching of the extraterrestrials fought and also by Asket, Billy Meyer had the occasion to learn an exceptionally amount and variety of knowledge as well as capabilities and abilities which far exceed any such of other terrestrial human beings. Additionally, he was able to learn and acquire the so-called Geisteslehre, translated into English read as spiritual teaching. And it is this spiritual teaching, a very ancient teaching based on entirely on reality and without any yoke of belief that Billy Meyer has to teach and spread among the terrestrial population. But more about this in chapter seven. In repetition, during his long, la la 
during his lifelong, extraordinarily hard training and education, Billy Meyer was able and became capable to use and apply astonishing consciousness-based abilities. By and by, and over the years, quite a number of persons were lucky to witness a few demonstrations of these, Billy's phenomenal abilities. In most cases, these demonstrations occurred as a surprise and without any announcement from Billy's side. Many examples are included in the Zeugenbuch, Zeugenbuch, here's the title, translate witness book, witness book, or the book of witness reports, which is available in German only. Besides the many, many reports of day and night sightings of the various beam ships, that book also contains several reports by group members who themselves had the rare chance to see several of the extraterrestrials with their own eyes. Billy's ex-wife, for example, had a short, surprising encounter in her living room with Ptah. And since the publication of that book, that book here, a few members more had the chance to witness the presence of some of Billy's extraterrestrial visitors. And these reports, of course, are not in this book. I will finish this chapter with two examples of Billy's extraordinary abilities or capabilities. The first one had happened near midnight, imagine near midnight, dark, of the first 21st of September 1978. The demonstration based on a bet between a core group member and Billy for a sum of one million Swiss francs. Well, Billy won the bet, of course, but he's still waiting for the sum to be paid to him. And this core group member is no core group member anymore. He succeeded to hit with one shot from his sick pistol a postage, postage stamp glued onto a piece of paper that was fastened to a wooden pole 206 meters away. Usually you shoot it competitions, they shoot 10 meters, 30 meters in Olympic Games, 206 meters, night, not dark. And before his shot, uh, here you see the paper, uh, of the original paper here, you see, and here was the, the stamp in the middle, and he, this with this pistol, he shot. Uh, before his shot, Billy asked if the shot would also count if he would be hit just uh, near the etching of the postage stamp. stamp. And this was accepted. Remember, it was dark there at Sedalik. This was at Sedalik, uh, quite a, a famous place for beam ships uh, photos, nearly midnight. The only light source was a flashlight that was directed from Billy's position. Billy was laying down there. Uh, on the ground, someone had a flashlight, and flashlights in those days were not as good as today, of course. And the flashlight that was directed from Billy's position along the gravel road down towards the target. 206 meters with a pistol, and there were four witnesses present. They have, have uh, the signatures are here, and here you see you know, the, the result from a close up. Just as he had asked, he hit them, the stamp here on the edge. On the, edge yeah. the other occurrence was a funny story by one of three witnesses who had sat on a trailer, like this, a Kubota trailer, tractor. And with a trailer, they were on their way from Schmidrütti down to the valley to a nursery garden in order to purchase some trees and bushes for the Semiasa Zero Star Center. Billy was sitting on the tractor. These were removed here, uh, the sides. Steering it and singing, singing loudly, they had a, were in good spirits. And after some time, the, the three men who were sitting on the trailer, without, without this coverage here, Notice that while driving, Billy had his right arm stretched upwards to the roof and holding its edge 
Upon watching more closely, they noticed that the steering wheel was turning to the left and right as if steered by an invisible hand. Of course, there was just one possible, possible solution to the mystery, the application of consciousness-based power. Anyone who is the false opinion that such, such is not possible, I refer to the impressive and astonishing exercises performed by, for instance, Shaolin monks or other individuals who also do everyday and also to everyday demonstrations by a vast number of human beings who are applying their thought power usually entirely unconsciously, namely by performing a placebo or nocebo effect. This is also something that is uh, evoked and, and affected by uh, just by thinking and the might of thoughts. The, that book explains how this is working. Anyone who is interested to learn more about all kinds of similar and strange experiences in connection with Billy Meyer will find astonishing reports in the book I've mentioned, and of course also in the so-called contact reports. And this leads us to chapter five, contact reports. There is nothing on earth which could be compared with this enormous body of information and knowledge about all aspects of life and science for example, about space and time, preservation of health, spiritual teaching, historical information, the mismanagement of wrongdoings and wrong, wrongdoings of, in politics, economy, economy, religion, in generally, and generally in society, and also about overpopulation and its devastating effects upon all aspects of life. These contact reports also contain a huge amount of detailed and very valuable information to improve one's health, and to avoid all kinds of dangerous ingredients and products and so forth, which severely threaten everybody's health. In my opinion, starting with block one and reading through the already available 7,500 pages is an optimal introduction to the Billy Meyer case. For those of you who are searching for English in translations of these country parts, here you have the, the cover of the first one, we'll find, uh, we'll find here, uh, search English translation, of the, we'll find search on the future of mankind website in England, a translation process, project, is going on and continuously new translations are posted on that website. Hopefully then sometime in the future the English book version of this contact will be available as, as a book, yes. The verbatim reproduction of the conversations presents a profound insight into the various modes of thinking and personalities of both Billy and his extraterrestrial visitors. Besides, the contact reports also display a lot of information about unpleasant behavior by group members. This person here included, I was also scolded by Ptah, at least in one instance, and I learned something of it. Something which is absolutely unlikely to be found published elsewhere and in any UFO case or esoteric group, etc. And this really represents a strong indication for the fact that FIGO is no cult. As of today, 15 books with the title Pleiadisch, Pleiadische Kontaktberichte, each of them containing at least 500 pages, are providing an incomparable insight into the Billy Meyer case. And here I have a little statistic, an updated one you see from January 28, 1975 to August, uh, last month, Billy had 1,944 personal face-to-face -face and 1,399 telepathic contacts with members of the Play on Federation. And of, of these many, many, many contact conversations, meetings, 722 contact reports exist. As of August, this August here, 
there's another statistics. These are the persons, um, 61 men and women from other worlds, who have visited Billy Meyer to this day. All of them, except Svart here, are still alive. After I had posted my video about the correct pronunciation of uh, extraterrestrial names on YouTube last year, I was informed I had uh, not read and mentioned all names of Billy's visitors. Therefore, I will use the occasion now to complete my project and to pronounce the rest of the names I, I had stopped here with Uganda. And then here's the rest, and this Dakaran, the first, first appeared in August of this year. Jana Rara, Laricha, Quorga, Bermundas, Berzalia, Esenta, Etika, Kolkos, Laban, Sarold, Herialt, Quinto, Dakarana. These are the names. So I have fulfilled my job of last year. I'm closing this chapter with an example of the great amount of valuable information contained in the contact reports. This information I found in the recent contact report that is not yet published. And uh, I think I, I'm allowed to publish it because it may be useful if you are plan planning a new house. Based on a question by Billy Ptahset, that the magnetic radiation of the hot cooking areas on induction stoves is detrimental to the human being's health and leads to severe, severe health impairment culminating in le le leukemia. Uh, that's blood cancer, leukemia. Leukemia, leukemia, leukemia. So um, you, sh you should prefer electric uh, hot, hot plates and not, uh, not by um, induction stoves, as they are uh, promoted now, nowadays. This widely discussed important aspect of the Billy Meyer case has led and continues to lead to a lot of critic. There are people who fundamentally deny the possibility to foresee the future and if a proposed event in the future is really occurring, they are speaking of a lucky guess. And there are those who deny that Billy Meyer would be capable to make true prophecies and predictions, all the while themselves believing in the content of the Bible, the Old Testament, where a lot of prophets, prophecies can be found among many. This one here in Isaiah, here. Uh, by the way, this is just one of the many inconsistencies and illogical claims to be found in the Bible and the New Testament. If you should find a person called Emmanuel in the New Testament, let me know. Actually, the true version of that prophecy reads like this and can be found in the Talmud Emmanuel. Therefore, the Ishwish, that's the the leader at that time, the, the one with the highest knowledge at that time, himself will give you a sign. Behold, a young woman is impregnated by a celestial son and will bear a son who, whom they will call Emmanuel. And this celestial son, this was Gabriel from the Pleon. This information may be found in the book Talmud Emmanuel, which contains the true story of the life and teaching of Emmanuel, who was born 2,000 years ago, and whose identity and teaching was later falsified into the delusional New Testament and the falsified figure, Jesus Christ. The original writer of the Talmud Emmanuel was Judas Iscariot, while the traitor with the name Judas Ishariot was the son of the Pharisee Simeon Ishariot. And here you see a picture of Judas Iscariot drawn by Da sketched by Ta and the right, the right side Emmanuel sketched by Semiase. In his book Celestial Teachings, published in 1991, the late James Dierdorf compared the Gospels of 
Matthew and Mark with the Talmud Emmanuel, and the result of his in-depth study revealed that the Talmud Emmanuel solved all the many inconsistencies and di divergences existing in the Gospels. But returning to the topic of prophecies and predictions, these are used to warn the people of coming events, and as a rule, they fo focus on negative prospects. And both prophecies and predictions are based on the universal basic law of cause and effect. While a prophecy may be altered, for example, by correcting and diverting a false development or false behavior and thinking attitude into a positive direction, a prediction cannot be averted or avoided because a predicted event or occurrence will happen in the future with 100% certainty. But at least there remains the chance of preparing oneself for the coming events and to initiate sensible measures. Several of Billy Meyer's books contain prophecies, predictions and probability calculations either made by Billy himself or by extraterrestrial authors of today or from ancient times. Many of those foreseen events and scientifically discoveries, etc., have already become a reality, usually fulfilled in their entirety or to a high degree, and only a few prophecies have been averted through various interventions by smaller or bigger groups of people or through some other influences. To demonstrate the fact that Billy Meyer and the extraterrestrials are really capable to foretell future events, I will present two examples. During the 150th contact of October 10, 1981, in a very long conversation between Billy and Quetzal, the two men were speaking about many predictions, among them the approaching red meteor on its collision course with Earth. If terrestrial mankind will not, not organize and effectuate sensible countermeasures, or if not through some planetary influences, the course of this meteor of about 350 meters diameter is somewhat diverted or averted, the result will bring enormous devastation when the crust of the Earth will be split from the North Sea down to the Black Sea. It's this uh, is uh, an artist's impression of the asteroid, how it, it could look like here, flying through space. Um, and this uh, red meteor, Billy and Ptah were speaking about in October 10, 1981. And it was detected by terrestrial scientists, this object, uh, 23 years later by Tucker, Tolan and Bernardi in 2004. In his book, Prophetien and Voraussagen, this was uh, the contact 150, and the copyright, the book, was published in 1996. Uh, that's uh, eight years before it uh, was detected by terrestrial scientists. My second example concerns the Kuiper Belt, the Kuiper Belt here between Neptune and Pluto. The theory of its existence had been postulated in 1980 by Angel Fernandez and in 1980 eight confirmed in a computer simulation by Scott Tremain, who coined, also coined the belt as Kuiper Belt, named after Dutch-American astronomer Gerald Kuiper. But four, five years earlier, in July 1975, Pda had said the other belt having been addressed by you, actually is still unknown and will be detected in the coming time and it will be called Kyber Belt. It's a different, uh, written a little bit different, but sounding re really um, 
nearly identical, of course, and it, of course it's, um, the, he's speaking about the same, the same belt here. And, uh, and there will also coming, of course, meteors and comets from, also from the Oort cloud. Also, Billy had written the term a little bit different in 1975, AI instead of UI. Phonetically, it sounded almost identical. There's no doubt that Pta was referring to the Kuiper Belt. For anyone who's interested in prophecies and predictions, I recommend Michael Horn's video and did they listen? There is a whole list of, uh, of predictions and prophecies. Uh, uh, Yes. After having mentioned now two predictions that turned out to be true, I'll continue with a few predictions that will occur with 100% certainty in the foreseeable future. However, it is not my intention, take note, to stir fear and panic, but just once more to warn the people who live in those areas so they may start necessary precautionary measures in order to fill the obligation for the protection of their own life, just as that of their family and others. What also has to make to be clear is that these events or catastrophes will occur during the lifetime of many of those human beings who are already alive. So it's already known, San Francisco will be totally destroyed and the region down to Los Angeles and San Diego will also be heavily affected. In 1977, in this magazine here, about the San Andreas Fault, an artist painted over a photo of San Francisco. This, yeah, painted over this uh, photo, and here you see an example of uh, how the situa situation could or would look like, like after this devastating um, earthquake happening there. And uh, yeah, during his jump into the future with Quetzal's ship, Billy Mai had the occasion to shoot photos of the devastation. Wendell Stevens had the chance to view Billy's photos of the destruction of San Francisco before these photos were confiscated by Quetzal. He wrote about his findings this, and uh, he studied these uh, photos, and I did see small cars smoothly around the corners and no external projections, meaning no rear mirrors, and some of these had half glass and others full glass cabin tops, make them look more like box than boxy cars. And we know that um, remote automatic driven cars are, are coming, are coming with 5G, and so uh, it could very, very well be when these are um, frequent frequently in use, uh, the time is near for this, uh, for this heavy devastation. However, the destruction of San Francisco will not be the only heavy devastation on the North American West Coast. Here, what Pta said during the 392nd contact. <coughs> Here, uh, there will be a sea quake not far off the American coast, from Portland, south of California, all the way up to Washington in the north, a gigantic, gigantic fault of several hundred kilometers, and uh, a sea quake, nine on the Richter scale, that's heavy. And that tsunami will spread out, and the sea quake, five minutes long, it will shake, huh? five minutes, that's a very long time, and then followed by mild, other and milder quakes. Yeah. In this respect, uh, I already told about this, I think, uh, in, in a forum presentation in the New Yorker. There was a very interesting 
uh, uh, article, a lot, very long article by Katrin Schulz, which uh, provoked a lot or raised a lot of response. And she then had to f write a follow article, how to stay safe when the big one comes also to be found if you are looking for this or Katrin Schultz you will find this uh, on the New York website it's uh, oh, what you will learn is that America is less prepared to earthquakes than for instance uh, Japan Japan is far more be, far more uh, advanced in the earthquake protection countermeasures. And here you see a, a, an interesting information by Henoch, that's a prophet proclaimer who lived uh, 11,000 years ago in sentence 217, far in the west it will be different, meaning the United States. The United States of America will be a country of total destruction and this is already 11,000 years ago, this Henoch force has foreseen these coming events here. But of course, not only the American continent will be affected. In uh, the year 2002, research scientists detected beneath the surface of the Mediterranean Sea the biggest volcano in Europe, Mount Marsili, that's here, this is Sicily here, Italy, Italy, Switzerland up here, former Yugoslavia here, Sardinia and Corsica. In the Mount Massilia, the Tyrrhenian Sea to the north of Sicily in Italy. When this very high and steep slope, sleep, steep slope volcano will break out or a, a part of it will break down, a huge tsunami must be expected. The development process towards that catastrophe has already started a couple of years ago and the recent strong eruption here of Stromboli should be heeded as a broad wink. But of course the other side of the globe will also be affected, for example when Auckland in New Zealand will be blown up, as Billy said. And the information, because uh, Auckland is, is built on a very uh, active volcanic zone and this will blowing up means there will be some fire there become visible and the information from the con contact reports that Tokyo is equally vulnerable as San Francisco is nothing to treat lightly I will close this chapter by pointing out that since, since it is possible to foresee what will occur in the future, the possibility to travel into the future cannot be denied. And if time travel into the future is possible, then also traveling into the past or being visited by visitors from the future is equally possible. This, however, does not mean that everything we do is predetermined and our fate is already set in tablets of stone. But that's another, something other to go into details in another presentation. I come to the last chapter here, the man himself. In chapter 5, I've mentioned that by reading all contact reports, you may get a clear impression about the personalities and the character, especially of those persons who are frequent conversation partners to Billy, as for, for instance, Semyase, or Tahir, Quetzal, Florena, Dalida, and so forth, and Ediana. But above all, you may get a clear picture or impression of Billy's mode of thinking, modesty, discipline, character, intelligence, and persistence. And if you would have the chance, as I do for over 30 years, to work closely with Billy in all kinds of situations and in everyday life circumstances, thereby observing an identical overall behavior on his side compared to what's conveyed in the contact reports, then you know this man is authentic. He's no imposter, no deceiver, no manipulator, no guru and no cult leader. Is leading a simple, secluded life 
is working seven days a week and the entire 365 days of the year, with the exception of times when he is ill or has to undergo treatment in a hospital. Of course, he's a strong personality, always available to give good counsel, and he is treating all group members without any favoritism, and he's rigorously taking care that the free will of each group member is respected at all times and in every situation. Actually, he's a role model for me and also for others, especially through witnessing how he's living the following seven principle from the spiritual teaching, namely modesty, anti-materialism, he has not uh, ten Rolls Royce in his garage like others had, perseverance, patience, repeating everything again, explaining, explaining all the time, peace, universal love and understanding. However, this does not mean that he's a superman because actually he's a human being like you and I and of equal value as all other human beings in the entire universe. Of course, he has an extraordinary, he has extraordinary mental abilities which are necessary to fulfill his task as a teacher of the spiritual teaching because this is actually his main, main task, the purpose in his life, being a teacher of the spiritual teaching and he dislikes any attempts by anybody to put him above any other human beings and he also dislikes to be treated like an animal in a zoo. He doesn't like visitors coming to him, posing for photos and saying then, oh, I've met Billy and something. He doesn't want to be someone extraordinary. Anyone who could witness the situation where Billy had to raise his voice to reprimand an unjust behavior or when he is addressing the foul, evil and warmongering machinations in politics, economics, religion, sectarianism, sectarianism and society in general with harsh but true words will surely lose any tendencies of idealization. Uh, he can become really <laughs> loud and, and, uh, and then he's scolding at the person, criticizing behavior Two seconds later, he is returning and speaks uh, calmly with another person. <laughs> so so uh, he has control usually about his uh, any emotions. And a special proof for Billy's firm dedication and his self-chosen mission is the fact that despite the so far 23 assass assassination attempts on his life, 23 so far, he continues with his mission undeterred. Any one of the many self-appointed fake contactees to extraterrestrials would have immediately stopped their delusional or cheating activities if having to, had to experience an assassination attempt. And it may be worthwhile to ponder the fact that not any of the numerous cheaters in the ufological and esoteric circle has to fear an assassination attempt. This in stark contrast to Billy, who is telling the truth and disseminating his opinion about the atro atrocious conditions with harsh words of truth. Here you see a couple of, uh, after being shot at, true uh, evidence here. He, he, he was sitting with Wendell Stevens in front of the house when certainly he, he had a, a he had a, a pain in his back, he moved his head and between Wendell and Billy, the shot where he just had been a fraction of a second before that the shot what, okay, uh, here hit, hit the wall and this was the projectile here. And here he had dreamed an attempt 
three, three times before, uh, in, uh, before. Uh, a warning dream, and then he put this metal plate be behind his uh, book here, agenda. Yeah. And here a, a tree where he, he, he felt the project, he felt uh, a swish before his, his head. Uh, these were several. Huh? I'm coming to the closing statement here. All the information from the seven chapters which I listed and explained as evidence to prove that the Billy Meyer case is authentic and true is just of minor importance. The fundamental, decisive, and irrefutable proof that tops all other arguments is the incomparable body of knowledge and wisdom in his books. Everybody with an open mind can apply the essence of what has been read in one's own life and prove to oneself its truth and reality. And the fact that the spiritual teaching, spiritual teaching is based 100% on reality is proof of its timeless validity. This, quite contrary to any religion or ideology, which are based on belief and therefore will vanish sooner or later because they will be proven as untrue and contradictory to reality. However, Billy's books continue to be effective, valuable and in use as long as human beings exist in our universe. And it is FICU's main purpose to ensure that the teaching is made available and preserved in unaltered form for the coming time. And this, my presentation of today, is a tiny contribution towards this venerable objective. I will close my presentation by using Joel Tisk's words at the end of his article. Of course, none of this will ever be enough for the die-hard skeptics as once people take to a side stance, as they often do with politics and religion, literally nothing will change their position, no matter how strong the evidence that is presented. I will end by saying, I did not write this article with the intention it would change even a, sing a single skeptic, because I know I won't, or it, wo it won't. The article was simply written for those with an open mind, reasonable intelligence and a desire for the truth. That's it.